And, and if the U.S. actually goes down publicly in a hard crash, can you imagine the confidence-destroying uh, shockwaves that's going to have and the bedlam that is going to break out uh, from that? Oh, yeah. And, you know, as I said, there's only two choices. Either we have massive inflation that destroys the economy or we avoid the massive inflation with big increases in interest rates. And that destroys the economy. But there's no way around it. I mean, at least if we destroy the economy without destroying the dollar, uh, then we can rebuild a viable one. Because what we have now has to be destroyed eventually because it's an abomination. It's not a real genuine economy. All we're doing is borrowing money and spending it on stuff. And, and that's not viable in the long Long run. So the sooner we can address these problems, the better. But, you know, it's not going to be easy to do it. I mean, we have to atone for, you know, a lot of sins. Sure, At least sure. And Ron the, Paul understands this. And, and, and the establishment, you know, d doesn't want to go in that direction because they get first use of that zero percent money and then get to loan it out. But they are basically. Uh, like the snake consuming itself, you know, in the end game, it, it's 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 terrible. How do you think then the you know the constellation of 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 special interests that control Washington and Europe, uh, you know, knowing uh, researching what they're going to do, so you can make uh, your financial uh, decisions. How do you see them responding? Because I see them getting ready for collapse, civil unrest. Trying to start wars. They might be, you know, if they're smart enough to understand that's going to happen. But they're, you know, they're just trying to get by election cycle to election cycle. They just want to make sure that they're the ones in office, that they have the power, and they're going to deal uh, with these crises and they're going to use them as an opportunity to grab even more power and more wealth for themselves. And they're going to blame it all on, uh, you know, capitalism and the inherent failures that we need to rely on government uh, to solve. When government but, you know, did ultimately, it. Ultimately, the, the real winners, Alex. And this are going to be that the emerging markets, countries like China, that are wasting a fortune, uh, propping up our economy, trying to keep us consuming things that we can't afford. You know, we are really screwing up the global economy. So we you agree with Jim Rogers? Monetary policy. Hmm? So, so you agree with Jim Rogers on that? Yeah, I mean, that is going to be a giant, you know, uh, you know, like a, a huge new revolution outside the United States. When, when when the U.S. finally collapses, people think, well, gee, the whole world is going to suffer. No, the world is suffering now. The world is suffering the cost of having to support us, having to keep lending us money, having to keep supplying us with goods and resources that other people are doing without. But in the short so term, do you agree it's going to have some wild shockwaves? Excuse me? In the short term, do you agree it's going to have some shockwaves, though? Well, it's going to have shockwaves, but some of them are going to be very positive for the countries that have been lending us money and supplying us with goods. I mean, their their people are suffering now. I mean, you always hear people talk about the fact that Americans are living beyond their means. And many, a lot of people agree we are living beyond our means. But how is that possible? It's only possible because somebody else outside of America is living beneath their means. And so if we stop living above our means, that means the people who are living beneath their means now can see a big increase in their standard of living because they can start consuming commensurate with their own productivity. So uh, many people are going to benefit uh, when this economic you know, pecking order reverses. You know, We're way up on the top of the pyramid right now, but we're not going to stay there because we don't belong there. We got to the top because we were the freest people. We were the most productive people. And we did that because we had the smallest government that didn't regulate, that didn't tax, that didn't micromanage. That's not the case anymore. We don't have that comparative advantage in freedom. We're a high tax, high regulated society and we're mired in debt and we're simply living off of our past glory, but we don't deserve the status that we have. And eventually, you know, reality is, you know, the perception is going to match the reality, just like the stock market bubble burst because it wasn't what people thought, just like the real estate bubble burst. This U.S. bubble, this government treasury dollar bubble is going to burst. And when it does, I mean, we're going to have to deal with the consequences, which are going to be horrific. Well, I agree with that. I uh, only got a few more questions, Peter. What's the time? I mean, I know you keep saying we don't know the exact times, but if you had to dead reckon, when will everybody basically know that this process you're talking about has played itself out? 
Well, when the dollar is no longer the safe haven, when treasuries are no longer the safe haven, I don't know how much longer we have. I think that this is the time period where all the highly indebted sovereigns are having to deal uh, with the consequences of their profligacy. And you're seeing it play out in Europe first. But, it, you know, it's, you know, it's going to happen for the U.S. It's, look, Japan has got debt problems. There are a lot of governments that have borrowed too much money and they haven't had to you know deal with the problem. And now it's happening. It started in Europe. You know, just like if you remember, how did the mortgage crisis uh, evolve? It started in subprime. And at the time, all the experts, including the Fed and the Treasury Department, said, don't worry, it's contained. It wasn't contained. It just simply moved up the food chain. It can Consumed all the mortgages, including the prime mortgages, because the problem was the same throughout the mortgage industry. It wasn't simply, you know, the subprime market, but that's what a lot of people thought. That's the same thing with sovereign credit. So it's why have they lowered your, France to our level uh, in credit rating, but then they still say the U.S. is better and everybody floods here? Is it because the United States has the most nuclear weapons? I don't think that has anything to do with it. But, you know, yeah, it's it's interesting that the dollar is down today. Treasuries are up because people are worried that France just got downgraded. They got downgraded to the same level that America is already at. It's so, and, and, and the truth is we don't even deserve the double A plus rating that we currently have. We should have been downgraded many latches below that. In fact, I don't even think we should have an investment grade. I think our debt is junk. There is no possible way we can repay it with real money. Sure, now, Peter, maybe you missed my point. I mean, it. obviously, the giant U.S. military, though, and the final equation is probably why our rating is still high. I'm not saying we deserve that, but well, obviously that, well, that fact... I don't know how the how our, our military has anything to do with our credit rating because if we end up printing a bunch of money to pay our bills and we screw our flatter, our creditors, it doesn't matter uh, that we can blow them up, we're not paying them back. I mean, there is no feasible way. Okay, then that why Americans do we still have that high rating if it's junk, as you say, which I agree? Well, we have it. Look, the, the, the S&P put AAA ratings on uh, mortgage paper that went to zero. I mean, the, I think there's a lot of politics involved uh, with these rating agencies. I mean, the government sanctions them. There's not that many companies that are even authorized to rate securities like S&P. So I think they're under a lot of pressure not to anger the governments. And so I think they uh, they give them too high a rating for, for, the, for that reason. But look, a lot of people just don't want to admit the obvious or they're oblivious to it. Just like I said earlier, the Federal Reserve and all their expert economists were on the cusp of the greatest collapse since the Great Depression, and these experts had no idea it was coming. I mean, that's the equivalent of a weatherman not being able to see sure. a Category 5 tornado when it's 50 miles off the coast. <laughs> Yet these clowns are still sure. in charge of making economic policy. So, if, you know, if the Fed economists couldn't figure it out, why should the S&P or Moody's economists be any better? I mean, they're, they're, they're getting well, the people from the same sources. Let me add this final proviso on it and, and to get your take on it in closing with a brief mention of Iran and what you think about that. Look. If the State Department, if these major corporations based in the U.S. have been buying off politicians, paying people off, giving them sweetheart business deals, the world is holding all these dollars. They know they've been conned. They know they've been ripped off. They know they're being devalued. But they realize if they stop propping up the U.S., they'll really be devalued. So they're so deeply involved in the Ponzi scheme, just like somebody on Social Security, even though it's going to bring down the whole system, they can't extricate themselves out of it. You always can. I mean, sometimes you think you're in a trap where you have to throw good money after bad forever. But I think when our creditors really take a look at this, and I'm sure they already have, you take China, for example, and if China has two, two trillion and change worth of our worthless IOUs, and they think, gee, we can't afford to stop propping them up because we'll take a hit on this two trillion, well, that means they're going to have to have five trillion. That means they're going to have to have 10 trillion. They're going to start thinking about the dollars that they're going to own in the future, not just the ones they already own now. It's better to take a hit on two trillion then eventually take a hit on 10 trillion yeah. you know so that they're going to start to look at it because we are asking them to really really back up the truck and up the ante and and buy in in, in much larger quantities 
Uh, and of course, it's money they're throwing away. They're not really lending us money at this point. They're giving it to us because we can't pay it back. I mean, yes, they can use their, their, their interest payments to buy more bonds, but they can't use it for something that actually benefits the Chinese. They can't take the money and spend it on something they want. All they can do is keep loaning it back to us and we buy the stuff that we want, but it's not helping the Chinese. It's amazing. Well, uh, very interesting points, uh, and uh, the, the, the clock is ticking on um, this situation. It is a time bomb, obviously. In closing, any thoughts on Iran and, and, and how those escalations? I well, mean, look, it's, it's just a shame that we're, we're in so much trouble financially, yet you know, we, we, we stir up so many hornets' nests over there in the Middle East and just make more problems for ourselves to have to deal with. We're already broke. The last thing that we can afford is a, a, a more uh, you know, military expenditures when we're already spending too much money on it as it is. I mean, that's where Ron Paul's got it right. You know, and, and I think he, I, I think other than Rick Perry, he's the only Republican candidate that actually served in the military. All these other chicken hawks are out there talking about we need more. We need to go to war uh, when none of them actually are you know served. But Ron Paul understands what it means to defend his country, and he doesn't want uh, to just uh, escalate uh, overseas uh, wars uh, that actually make the country less safe. You know, wants to promote national defense. And so uh, this is just another example of the blowback that that Ron. Paul has been warning us about, and people try to spin that against him as if he's trying to blame the American people for the problems. Look, he doesn't blame the American people, but he certainly thinks that our leaders have bad policy, and our foreign policy has been bad, and it has contributed to a lot of the resentment that's felt around the world uh, for the United States, that we should rethink uh, that type of foreign policy and be more concerned about defending America, especially uh, not from the Middle East, but from Washington, D.C. I mean, that's where our greatest threat to where our liberty comes from. It doesn't come from without. It comes from within. No kidding. Look at the NDAA, all of it. Peter, I'm about to end the show. Let me say bye to you here in just a moment. All right. well, thank you. Folks, that was an amazing interview with Peter Schiff. Uh, we'll be back this Sunday on the syndicated radio show, 4 to 6, back Monday, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. And of course, back here next Monday night, Lord willing, uh, at uh, 7 a.m. Central. Uh, this, that's it for this Friday 13th. 2012 edition of InfoWars Nightly News. Great job to the crew and great job to all the subscribers at InfoWarsNews.com. I'm Alex Jones, signing off.